Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure that today we have here Yanis Snaragdakis um, from University of Oregon, Eugene. So we originally came in touch through one of his PhD students, Christoph Seiner, who was working on test generation and data generation. But actually, Yanis is working on so many things and so many other things. And today he will talk about um, class morphing. So. Thank you very much, okay. Nikolai. So I'm going to talk today about class morphing or put otherwise safely shaping a class in the image of others. And uh, everything that I'm going to discuss is actually prototyped in a language that we call MorphJ. I'm Yanis Magdax of the University of Oregon. As Nikolai already said, uh, I know that the standard questions I'm going to get are either where is the University of Oregon or uh, how are things down in Portland? Well, we're not in Portland. We are in Eugene, a couple of hours south of Portland. It's a beautiful place and you should come visit. It's not that far away. Uh, and everything I'm discussing is joint work with my PhD students, Shansan Huang and David Zook. This is actually Shansan's dissertation, so she's done pretty much most of the work uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, please interrupt me with questions throughout the talk, because otherwise it's going to get really boring. I haven't planned this uh, to be an entertaining talk. It doesn't have lots of videos or anything, so we should make it interactive to be entertaining. Okay, so... Standard motivation. What I want to do is enhance the abilities that we have in programming languages for modular software construction. Uh, we don't want our software to be a big lump of code uh, with, uh, uh, with non-transparent communications between the pieces. Uh, we actually prefer it to be very well modularized. We want to separate all the pieces, make them into separate modules, and have clear interconnections between the modules. And further than that, we want, we want when these modules replicate the same functionality but with different interfacing, uh, we want to factor them out. And that's a traditional abstraction uh, process. And in programming languages, we can see everything that we do in the evolution of programming languages as an evolution of abstraction mechanism. So pictorially, what I want to do is take the blue pieces, factor them out, put them in a single piece, and have everything else communicate with those through a well-defined interface, but maybe customize this for uh, different communication. Or to put it otherwise, if I view language features in two axes of generality and safety, the very first step in the evolution of high-level programming languages has been procedural abstraction back in the 60s. And procedural abstraction basically scores very high on the safety axis. And not that high on the generality axis, although it's still pretty high compared to what we had before. And by procedural abstraction, I mean I take a piece of code, like i times 100 divided by 27. You know, The specifics of the example don't matter that much. I take an expression that would appear in multiple places throughout my code base, and I abstract it away in a procedure. That was the big thing back in the 60s. And ever since then, uh, we've tried to make progress to have even more powerful abstraction mechanisms. Now, I say that procedural abstraction scores fairly highly in terms of safety because when I look at this procedure, I can both reason about it modularly. I can just look at it and treat it as a mathematical object in my head. I understand what it does without looking at where it's being applied. And at the same time, the compiler or the machine can reason about it. So the type system can say, oh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a procedure that takes an int and returns an int. I don't need to know anything else about it to know how it plays with everything else. So arguably, the next big step in programming languages is type abstraction. And by type abstraction, I mean a whole bunch of different mechanisms. And you can think of it as traditional polymorphism in its many forms, ADA packages, ML modules, Java generics, C++ templates, whatever. But the main uh, element in all these mechanisms is that they abstract away from the type that's being used in a piece of code. Uh, and here, I'm just showing an example in Java generics. I have an array list of E. I'm abstracting away over whatever E might be. And then I'm using E, which is an unknown type, 
in multiple places in my program. So I can declare an array of elements E, or I can say that this method here accepts an E as an argument. Now, the big thing is that type abstraction allows us to abstract away from the type, even if the low-level code that we generate is completely different for different types. So maybe, actually, I will generate completely different code for this uh, if I say E is int versus whether uh, when E is string. Now, yes? It seems to me that you skipped over one step between uh, procedural and type abstraction, which is the idea of an abstract data type. OK. Is that true? I mean, or do you think of abstract would, data type as just would, very close to procedural abstraction? I would think of it actually as closer to type abstraction. Well, I would say that um, not necessarily. So you're basically talking about encapsulation. Yeah. Uh, and you're right. That may be a step that uh, I kind of skipped, or one can see it probably as something that bridges between procedural yes. abstraction and type abstraction. Uh, I'll have to think about it more. Uh, obviously, this classification is a bit philosophical. Okay. But uh, I, I agree that this may be a strong argument there for having another category in the middle. But my point generally is that there are many different type abstraction mechanisms, and some of them are not perfectly safe, while others are perfectly safe. So, for instance, when you reason about C++ templates, you cannot really argue about the correctness of a template without knowing what parameters you give to it. So there may be type errors that only demonstrate themselves with some specific parameters, but not others. Whereas with ML modules, Java generics, whatever, you have modular type safety at least. You can look at this thing, and say the type checker or myself as a programmer will verify that it does the right thing regardless of what the AE is. And my proposal is that the next big thing or the next step that we want to go towards is something that I call structural abstraction. And the mechanism that I'm going to talk about today can be viewed as a special case of structural abstraction just like the many different kinds of polymorphism are uh, special cases of type abstraction. And the mechanism specifically that I'm talking about is called morphing. So what is structural abstraction? It's abstraction over the members of another type. So I want to abstract common things that would apply to all fields or all methods of another type and put them in one unit only and then apply them uniformly everywhere. And let's jump right away in an example of morphing and the language, the reference language that we have, MorphJ. Uh, the main thing that MorphJ adds over Java, which is the base language we're extending, is static reflection over members of type parameters. So what I have here is a class method logger that takes a type parameter x. Uh, we also have to declare that uh, x is a class. And this is actually a mix-in. So method logger of x extends x. So x becomes the superclass of method logger of x. And the main thing that we are adding is this line over here. And this line is a static for loop over all the methods of x. So what does it really say? It says, for all methods of x that satisfy this pattern here, uh, namely that they're public, they return an integer, and the method name is meth, actually meth is declared here as a name parameter. That's what's being declared in uh, regular brackets before the for statement and that take any arguments, because y is declared here as a type parameter, and it's actually uh, postfixed by a star, which means it can match any number of types here. So basically, any methods that are public return an integer with any name, any argument types, I want to declare an equivalent method here, same name, same argument types, returns an integer, and what this method does is fairly trivial. It's just a logger of the return value, it will call the corresponding method in its superclass and will print the value that's being returned before returning it. So is A here a single argument or multiple arguments? A is actually multiple arguments. We cannot divide them in any way. So we'll treat them as a unit. So everywhere A appears, it will appear as a whole thing. So the, the, the only limitation is that they cannot say the first three elements of A or anything like that. So with an actual example, if I have a class C that has int add, int i, int j, and print, and increment, this pattern will match certainly the first method because uh, it has an int return type, meth, meth will match add, y will match the entire type signature, and method logger of C would be equivalent to a class 
that basically has this method, int add, int i, int j, and the corresponding body. Print does not match, because it does not return an integer, and the last method, inc, does match, returns an integer, uh, takes a single argument type, so my method logger of C would indeed have an inc method. Basically, that's the main idea, so I want to be absolutely sure that everyone gets this part, because everything else will build on this part. Yeah? So, uh, I assume you have the uh, method logger class extend x, so that dynamic binding will choose the method logger's implementations logger yes. to call. But what happened? So, but I didn't hear you say anything in the matching about the fact that it should match only virtual methods. Well, first of all, uh, it, it, the way it's written right now, it will do the same thing for static methods. But is that your question, but or not, whether? I'm worried about methods that aren't going to get dynamic from now. Right. So in, in those methods, methods that aren't virtual, there is no such thing in Java, okay. so we didn't have to worry about that. But they can be declared final. Yeah. Well, in this case, uh, we actually don't match final methods, but that's just the convention. It's just a convention that if you omit the keyword, we do not match final methods. But we could just as easily have chosen the opposite convention. It's just a matter of defaults of what happened when you omit some things. Like, for instance, if I had omitted the public, the, an equally arbitrary default is that it matches all public and package protected methods. But again, that's kind of a default. We could make the user do the right thing, uh, specify everything that they really want to say, and then they would be warned about different errors. Yeah. Oh, you feel more general of all the type abstraction. So within Java or C sharp, this is more general because methods are accessed individually from each method. Right. But if you look, I can imagine a slightly more general object-oriented language, which has only where all the methods and uh, the form tuple. So there is mm -hmm. formally only one method with several components. Then, so I actually wanted to argue that can, it can be viewed as an extension of type abstraction, but it's definitely an, an extension in the sense that no language right now, no mainstream language offers that. And I'm not talking about the, just the Java C Sharp world, but also in the functional world. There's no sense of iteration uh, over the members of a type other than the, the whole scrap your boilerplate approach, which I'm going to talk about in the end. But that just computes a function. It does not let you declare new members that reflect over the existing members. Yeah. And, uh, you say morphing, but and then to me that meant like rewriting, but it seems like you're adding here, not, not necessarily. I'm actually adding. I'm never transforming anything. You're absolutely right. So the morphing part uh, alludes to the fact that the body of this method, method logger of something, gets morphed to match whatever x is. So I'm not really, morph does not mean transform. It means its shape is fluid, and it gets to match something else. But the system is purely additive. Yes, what? the what? system is purely sure. additive. The original type is not modified in any way. So in that sense, very different from the aspect oriented. In yeah, that sense, exactly. But the, doesn't, uh, doesn't Sing Sharp have like a similar idea of compile time or stuff? Exactly, and that's the closest related work. You're, you're actually jumping way to the end of my slides and all three or four points that were raised. Well, no, but that's a good thing. It's better to, to have those as they arise rather than wait to the very last slide. So in general, a template programming language can have a lot of power as exemplified by C++. So here I take it you're restricting uh, the power. Of, I can think of this as sort of like a template programming language, but uh, with more type safety and the more it's not Turing complete, I take it. It's not too incomplete. That's why we can do interesting type checking. And it's, uh, it's actually also an extension of regular template programming languages because in C++ you cannot do this. In C++ templates you cannot reflect over the members of an existing type. So, I mean, the only thing you can do is that there's one trick where you can declare a method conditionally and reflect on whether that exists. But you cannot just reflect over the members of unsuspecting types. Sorry to keep interrupting. A more technical question on this particular approach. So it seems like you're reflecting over the signature only, and the way that you're accessing the, the contents of the reflected over method is just by calling super. So you're, you're using the fact that you, you're actually also inheriting. 
That may be the only example where I'm actually calling super. I'm, I just did that to keep the example brief, okay. but I could do the same by not extending it, having an x declared in there, and then just initializing that x to some value and then dispatching to that. So I can do it by reference, or I can do it by calling super or any other way. But you don't have access to like the, the details of the method body. You Correct. Have. So right now, our reflection is based, uh, uh, our static iteration is exclusively at the reflection level, so we're just looking at signatures. And we can also do the same with fields. So kind of covered uh, is that in addition to the main extension over Java in this example, there are a couple of other extensions. Quick quiz, do you see any, uh, anything else other than this line that's an extension over Java generics? Referring to the argument. The, the, the YA, you're referring to a group of arguments. Also right. Like okay, so that's one. But, right. Yeah. But if, if we forget that Y is multiple things, then it's, this, is, this would be regular Java. So, yeah, you're right, but that's not what I was. You're extending from X. Right. I'm extending from X. So, Java generics do not allow mix ins. Uh, that requires a completely different translation approach. It requires an expansion approach as opposed to an erasure approach when we translate this. I don't, I don't want to get very much into that. And then the second thing would be that we have this keyword class in here. So we are allowing uh, a specification that says whatever you parameterize method logger with, it has to be a class and not an interface. And that's so that our type checker can tell that this extends X is actually uh, reasonable. And again, there's an issue with final there. But by default, we're assuming that it's a non-final class that we parameterize with. So that's getting a bit technical. So I'll, I'm going to try to offer a couple of examples to motivate why you want to do this. Uh, my biggest concern is that those examples are fairly simple. And I don't get to a really complex one until the end. And many people get the impression of, oh, this is good for just doing loggers. But is it good for anything else? Basically, it's good for anything that you would use a static for loop for. I want all the members of this type that do not exist in that type. I want to combine all the members of this type with the members of those type, either union them or intersect them and create a pair type, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are wondering whether something is uh, possible, ask me, and I'll try to offer examples uh, is my big point here. So this is a piece of code from the Java Collections framework. That's the standard data structure library in Java. Uh, basically, the Java Collections framework has a utility class called Collections. And inside that class, there's a multitude of nested classes. And one of those nested classes is Class Synchronized Collection. And it implements interface collection. And what it does is it declares a collection C, initializes it somehow. Uh, and it also declares an object mutex. Again, this is initialized in the constructor. But the main point is that for all the methods of interface collection, there are isomorphic methods inside synchronized collection. And all they do is synchronize on a mutex before dispatching to the original method. Very kind of brain dead, tedious code that we don't want to have to write. We want to abstract away this pattern, especially because this is not just for however many methods are in interface collection, which I think is between 15 and 20, so size, remove, but a whole bunch more. But this also applies to a whole bunch of other types. So there's also synchronized list in that utility class. And for all methods of interface list, like get and set, I have exactly the same thing. Synchronize on a mutex and then dispatch the original method. And the same for set and hash set, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to eliminate all this tedious complexity, which accounts for some 600 lines of code in class collections. And I want to replace that with just this morphed class. So what does this say? It says, I have a make synchronized class that takes an interface x as a parameter. It implements x. It holds a final reference to an x and to a mutex. And again, I'm not showing the constructor here, but it's exactly the same as would be in the other cases. And then for all the methods that exist in this type parameter x, which is an interface, that match this pattern here, and my pattern is any method name, any types, because a is declared as a type parameter with a star after it, and any return type, I'm declaring an isomorphic method that just synchronizes on a mutex and dispatches to the original method. 
And then I just take this and I apply it to make synchronized of collection and make synchronized of list, make synchronized of set, has set, etc., etc., and I get the types that I really want. Yeah. Something more complicated is filters or. Yes, they can. Um, in just two slides, I'm going to show a slightly more complicated pattern. But you can do filtering, so you can have some form of an if, and you can have some form of nested loop, so you can say for all the members of this class and all the members of the other class. There's one significant restriction. So we cannot just have arbitrary nesting of loops, because that would make our language Turing complete, and then our type system cannot do anything. So we have one significant restriction, which is that uh, all the type parameters that are used in the generated code, think of this piece as generated code, all this A and R, they all have to be matched by the very first pattern that I'm going to use, which we call the primary pattern. But that's getting a bit technical, and I can discuss it offline probably with people who are really curious. Yeah. So list and collection are in a, in a hierarchy in, in the original forms? Uh, uh, yeah. Um, could I, Actually, could, could I produce, a, so you, list, you have the interface list uh, mm -hmm. inheriting from the interface collection, right? Yeah. Could I produce a similar hierarchy then for my synchronized types? Like could I, could I... Implicitly without actually saying it? Uh, well, somehow saying it, but saying it generally so that if I, you know, interface X would, would not just take all the methods from, or make synchronized of X would not just take all the methods of X and stick them in one class, but I sort of have the same, get the same hierarchy. Well, I think your, your point is that make synchronized of list is not a make synchronized of collection. Right. Exactly. I don't get it. So, yeah. I don't so get basically it you want to say, uh, make synchronized is covariant. I want, you, you want to apply some annotation on make synchronized and say it's covariant. So if you give it a subtype and a supertype, make synchronized of the subtype will be a subtype of make synchronized of a supertype. And that's, that's actually a very interesting direction that we have not worked out the details of yet, but we are really interested in that. But I think, I think it, uh, it's, it should be possible. I don't know exactly where we will have to cut corners. In everything that has to do with variants, that with implicitly inferred variants uh, and complex type systems, somewhere you need to cut some corner. But I think that for the most common applications, we can probably uh, do a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah. When does type instantiation happen? Is it a compile time thing or a dynamic yeah. thing? It's compile time. It's compile time. Interesting. So could you apply, can you apply make synchronized to a make synchronized? Yes. Yes. You can apply make synchronized to make synchronized. I will also show a couple of examples later where one of the morphed class refers to another, one of the morphed class can extend another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But certainly there's no restriction. A morphed class is a first class citizen. It's type checked exactly the same way as everything else in, in the language. Okay, so the big picture here is that Morphing and MorphJ specifically lets us write code once and apply it to many program sites. And as mentioned earlier, so far this has been the privilege of meta object protocols and aspect oriented programming and all sorts of meta programming, all sorts of transformations. I just parse a program, take the abstract syntax tree, and I manipulate it in some way. Uh, and what MorphJ adds is modular type safety, and I'm going to get to this point in just one second. And arguably, it also adds better language synergy. Because the way I tried to present this is that it's a smooth extension of generic types. It's just like a generic type. I don't have a concept such as an aspect or a transform. I just have generic type. But my generic type can now iterate over the members of its type parameter. So the view that I have of the universe is that morphing is somewhere in the space of structural abstraction. And different metaprogramming techniques are here. Sometimes they can do way more things that we, than we can do. Some of them actually don't have the expressiveness that we are giving. Uh, but certainly they don't have the safety. So we score much more highly on the safety axis. So let me try to argue a little bit about that. I told you that morphing offers modular type safety. Modular type safety in this setting means that the generic class is verified on its own and not when I instantiate it. Uh, and it's a type error if any type parameter can yield a type error if I were to completely expand the, the generic class. Which means that if I have this guarantee, then I can distribute generic code with high confidence. 
I can say, here's a piece of generic code. I haven't just tested it with integer and string, and I know that it type checks. I guarantee you that no matter what you try it with, it will always type check, which is exactly what you're missing when you're doing, say, C++ templates, uh, which are not modularly type safe. So let me try to give an example here to see why this would be desirable. So I have a class call with max, uh, takes a type parameter x, extends x, so call with max of x will be a subtype of x. And traditional for loop, it basically says that for all the methods of x that return an integer and take one argument y, I want to declare a similar method that takes two y's, a1 and a2. I want to compare them and I want to call my superclass method with whichever, with whichever one is the largest. So that's, that's why it's called call with max. Again, my pattern is fairly simple. Public uh, returns an int, takes any type y, so y is a type parameter, has any method name meth. Meth is a name parameter. Declare the same method but with twice the arguments. Compare them. Call the superclass method with a greater one. So where is the first bug here? Yeah. You don't know compare to return something comparable to zero? Well, actually, we, well, you can say it that way. But practically, we know nothing about compare to. I mean, which compare to is that? We don't know that type Y supports compare to. And part of that problem is, if, if, even if we have the notion of compare to, maybe it's in some type that we're always looking up, we don't know that, uh, that this compare to will return the right thing. But most importantly, we don't know that the existence is supported by A1. So the first fix here would be to say this type parameter Y has to extend comparable of y. So I need to specify that that's what I expect. I expect that this compare to will, will exist. There's actually a second bug here that's much more subtle that I expect my type checker to catch with, with respect to this. Now, does anyone want to venture a guess? I, I actually think it's a bit too obscure. OK, let me just jump uh, to it. So the point is that I'm introducing here some method with some name, twice the arguments of some method in the superclass. How do I know that there's no conflicting method in the superclass? So there are two kinds of checks that my type checker will perform. First of all, it will perform the check of validity. It will make sure that every call is well formed, is valid, like compared to, it's definitely going to be supported by A1. But it has to also perform a check of well-definedness, of unique definition. How do I know that this meth does not conflict with something in X that has the same type parameter, the, the same argument types, and a different return type, which would be an illegal override in Java? But you can replace there any well defined NS rules you want. So, for instance, what if I have a class C that has an int foo that takes another int, and at the same time it has an overloaded foo that takes two ints, doesn't return anything? That's a perfectly well-defined C. But if I say call with max of C, then call with max will declare now its own foo int int, but will return an int. That would be an ill-defined type. When I call foo with two integers, I will not know which one I'm talking about. So the point is we have two kinds of errors, validity and uniqueness of definition, well-definedness. And I want my type system to modularly check this. Just check the call with max and say, you know what? There is a type x that can make this result into ill-typed code. Yeah? I mean, I don't know that you just enumerated two things that can go wrong. How do you know there aren't three more things that can go wrong? Pretty much, if you think of all the static checks in a compiler, mm -hmm. they are of three different kinds. They are uh, validity checks. So if I, if I do an assignment, you can reduce everything down to assignment or down to method call depending on your philosophy. Uh, it's a validity check that the type of the right-hand side matches the type of the, right, of the left-hand side uh, or the type of the argument matches the expected type of the formal parameter. That's the validity. The second one is well-definedness, which always has to do with unique definition. And the third one is access pr protection. And access protection is kind of a weird flavor of well-definedness. But there's nothing else that statically a compiler tries to check. There's nothing that doesn't fall in those categories. And practically, everything is well-definedness or validity. So I didn't offer you an argument other than to say, 
you think about it, I think you'll convince yourself the same way I've convinced myself. Uh, but if you look at the language specification, that's, that's I think, okay. uh, exactly what happens. So, so is your proposal that, that any, any morphing like this that could possibly be constructed in this bad way is illegal or that it is simply illegal? I want a warning from the compiler. Stuff? And I want a language that lets me either correct this or tell the compiler you should not issue that warning because I know that when I use this, I'm going to use it with a class X that does not have any of these features. So I, I basically want the warning from the compiler in a way to suppress the warning, but a declarative way that fits my language. Okay. So I think you got the main idea of the checking. Let me uh, repeat the example slightly different in a more applied domain. Standard thing that we want to do in a programming language, and we usually write code by hand or we're using reflection. Let's say I want to add a getter or a setter to an existing class. So this is kind of the, the shortest way you can do it. You declare a subclass, add getter of class x, extends x, and for all the fields of x, I declare a method get f. So we have two new features of the language here. First, iteration over fields. And secondly, the hash, which just concatenates those strings because f will be whatever the f identifier will be, which is a main variable, which is a name variable up here. And it just returns f. There's the same bug as, as before. I don't know that x does not already have a conflicting getter. So, well, what did I do here? Okay, I don't know that x does not already have a conflicting getter that maybe doesn't return t. So it's an ill-defined class. How can I suppress this warning? Well, the way I can suppress it is through something called filter patterns. I can annotate my primary pattern with a nested pattern that says, and I want to iterate over all the fields of x that match this pattern, and also there is no method get f in x.methods. So this is a subservient pattern to the top one, because this f was matched up here by the first pattern, and it's used down here. Yes? First, you could argue that you're sort of working around Java's mechanics for well-definedness, which I so happen to disagree with. I think they have a big versioning problem there in, in that a descending class can't like define something that a base class, because as the base class versions, you could inadvertently break code, and you have no guarantee whatsoever that, that you know, and, and it's happened many times as they version the library, right. they end up breaking user code because they introduce methods that users already use. But, 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 but think actually, of it differently. Though I, I presented it that way just because that's the easiest way to fit pro problems on a slide. Think that I had two for loops and I want to make sure that they don't produce conflicting yeah. members. So it has nothing to do with a superclass yeah. or subclass. Yeah. Uh, you always have the uniqueness condition. You always have the, the, the condition that whatever my for loop produces in terms of methods has to be well defined. Okay. Um, the other one I, I was going to ask is can you give names to the results of these transformations? It would seem that, like, for example, if you have this add get, add getter of a class x extends x, which seems to be the pattern you use all the time, then in reality, you would want users to refer to the add getter of x, not the x. <laughs> yes. Right? And so how do you keep your names from becoming, like, hopelessly clumsy and then... Uh, and I don't have a good answer for that. I don't have a way to go and say, uh, go into this piece of code and remove every instance of, say, list, and replace it with may synchronize of list. Right. I mean, with this pattern of blah extends something, you know, is one that people use sort of in poor man's metaprogramming right. today, right? But you always end up with the, with the produced thing having the bad name and, and the real thing having the, the good name, but, but it's already been taken. Right? <laughs> yes. Uh, I haven't found a good way to get around this. Effectively, you would want a type def. You want, a, you want type synonyms. And the moment I have type synonyms, I can refer to them as regular types, and then maybe I can read nested members, et cetera. It's very easy to just introduce recursion with that and get into a Turing-complete language. That's what makes C++ templates Turing-complete, actually. That's what makes them hard. It's a type def. It's not so much all the rest of the stuff. The rest of the stuff can introduce Turing-completeness in a different way. But the type def is a killer. So unless we limit the type def significantly, like you cannot read any nested members, you cannot make any assumptions for it, it's just a macro that gives you a synonym maybe for a shorthand. Uh, that might be viable, but beyond that, I don't think that there's a good answer. I would love to have a good type def in generics, but just like Java generics, just like 
other generics as well. Yeah, <laughs> the, the answer is that type diffs are really, really tricky. They're not easy at all if you want to do them to really give all the power you want to the user. So, yeah, I think I pretty much exhausted this other than to say that this is something fairly general, uh, the nested patterns. So we can have nested patterns that qualify the first pattern. They can be both positive and negative. The positive patterns are introduced by keyword sum, and that's the way to do nested iteration, to say for all the members of this class that also exist in this class. Uh, the negative ones are with keyword no, just like what you see here. And uh, in fact, this is uh, the, the filter patterns or the nested patterns and the power they add are the topic of uh, our PLDI paper this year that's going to be up in a couple of months. Okay, so, uh, yes, I'm sorry. For example, you can check if this class has get f. Let's call it get sub one x f. That you can do. Uh, I'm not sure you can do it with uh, the pattern here. or So there are two things I can do. One thing is to say I expect, just like I say in this pattern here, I expect that my class x will not have a getter. So if I use a class X that does have a get already, uh, I'm sorry, in this case, I don't say that I expect that. In this case, it says for all the fields such that they don't have an X, a get F. So the fields that do have a get F are just skipped. The other thing that I can do is to say I expect that the class will not have a get F at all and issue me a warning if it does. But that's an instantiation warning as opposed to a warning on the properties of the generic code. The generic code is correct. The programmer stated the right assumptions. It's just the instantiation that's wrong. My question is if you can do the following. Not that it's very interesting, just to understand the syntax. So suppose we want to say, okay, for every f which does not have get sharp f, yes. uh, get public, yes. get public method get sharp f. Yes. And for those that do produce a new get, but just call it get sub one. Absolutely. You can. Yes, we can do that. And that's, uh, in fact, there's, there's a very nice example I can point you to, but it's, it's a little long, uh, that uh, solves the problem of take a class, take an interface, and for all the methods of the interface that are already supported by the class precisely, which means all the arguments and the return type agree, uh, just say, well, this, this is acceptable. Otherwise, uh, if there's a member in the interface, a method in the interface that's not supported by the class, provide a default implementation. If there's a conflicting member in the class, there's a method in the class that uh, incorrectly overrides a method in the, in the interface, don't copy that at all. And you produce a new class that looks after the original and implements the interface at the same time. And this has this, exactly the flavor that you described. If this exists, do that. If it does not exist, do something else, uh, etc. No, the only thing that we do to quantify over strings, the only manipulation that we have on strings is match existing strings like f and match uh, concatenation, like get of f. That's about the extent of our reasoning. Okay, so uh, let me give uh, a couple of uh, insights on the type checking at a fairly high level with uh, examples only. And hopefully this, this will be only 10 minutes. And I'll try not to drag too long. And I'll skip some stuff if it uh, looks like it's going to be long. So the challenge with type checking is that we want to type check a class with an unknown number of methods and fields, unknown method and field names, unknown type signatures of all the members, even an unknown superclass. And it's really interesting to ask whether this is even possible, and obviously I'm standing in front of you, so you probably know already that the answer is yes. And the main idea is that we do this, we manipulate those highly fluid objects by representing all the members of a morphed class as an abstract set, which is practically defined in our type system as a superset and a pattern. And what we want to ask is questions on subsets, on relationships between sets. Are these two sets of methods disjoint, or is one a subset of the other is the other question that we want to ask. And every interesting property that we have follows from those. So for instance, declaration uniqueness, 
is just equivalent to the disjointness of the declaration set with all other declaration sets. And we'll see examples. And this is done with a two-way two unification of patterns, which means I'm trying to find a satisfying assignment for both patterns, some types that I can substitute that satisfy both patterns. And then reference validity is basically I'm taking one set, which is the use set of a method, and I'm trying to prove that it's a subset of the declaration set. And this is done with a one-way unification of patterns. Basically, I want to say, is this a special case of the other one? So just a couple of examples. First is the very trivial one. Uh, very easy to show validity. So an easy reflection class takes an x, uh, declares a reference of type x, and somehow I have some code to set the x field. But the main point is that for all the int methods of x that don't return anything, I declare another method with the same signature, and I call x.n of i. And I want to confirm the validity. Oh, forgot the pointer. I want to confirm the validity of this call here. Now, this is fairly easy because what do I know about i in terms of the argument being correct? I know that it's an integer. What do I know about n? I know that it's a method that takes an integer. So the argument is correct. And the main challenge is to say, is there a method n, which is an unknown name? It could be print, add, foo, whatever, in type x. And of course there is because what I know about n is that I uh, did it by, I created it by selecting from the methods of capital X and lowercase x has type capital X. So in this case, it's fairly simple to see validity. N definitely exists, no matter what its name, I is definitely of the right type. Yeah? Are you going to talk about the complexity of the type checking problem? Uh, yes, but it's unification basically. So it's not uh, anything super exponential if you're thinking about that. So I don't know, I'm not that familiar with the literature, so unification means what? Unification means uh, po definitely polynomial. Uh, I want to say linear, but uh, don't quote me on that. But definitely low polynomial. I'm sorry? A bit higher. Yeah, it should be higher. Uh, yeah, what is the best complexity bound for unification? It's definitely something that we do routinely uh, in regular algorithms. It's not something weird. OK, so. This is the, a, a better example to demonstrate validity in full glory. So what I have here, let's start from the bottom, is a class reference with a type parameter x that declares a reference to a type declaration of x and has some code to set that, that value. And then for all the methods of x that take any arguments and return a string, it dispatches uh, an, uh, the right argument to the method of d of x. So the disconnect here is that we're iterating over methods of x, but what we're really calling is methods of d of x. So what's the type of d of x? Type of d of x is declaration of x, and the class declaration here is also a morphed class, so its members are generated through this loop over here. So generally declaration of y is a class that for all the members yeah, for all the methods of y that match this pattern, but basically this pattern means any method, any name, this is a name variable, any argument types, this is a type variable, and any return type, I'm doing something here. I'm, I'm declaring an isomorphic method. So the reasoning that will go in, inside the type system is basically the following. Does the declaration set subsume the use set? Is the use set a subset of the declaration set? And the way to check that is if the parents unify. So what we want to type check is this call down here. And it's perfectly reasonable that the argument is of the right type. So this argument, lowercase a, has type uppercase a, which is exactly what n expects, even if it's multiple uh, arguments. More importantly, what, what's really hard to type check is that n will really exist in dx of n. And the general approach to determining that is we take this pattern here and we try to unify it with this pattern up there in a way that this can be allowed to be more abstract than that, but not the other way. So in other words, I'm trying to unify this with that so that R can be a unification variable, M can be a unification variable, B can be a unification variable, but all those are considered to be unique values. So in this case, my unification goes like this. First of all, I have to determine that the ranges 
are compatible. And in this case, y and x are actually the same thing after substitution because I'm using this x here to instantiate y. But generally, the requirement is that the declaration pattern has to select methods from the subtype of the use pattern. A subtype has more methods. So if I have y as a subtype of x, then y is guaranteed to have at least the methods of x. And then it's just regular unification. And I'm just doing r to string unifies if it takes the value string, m unifies with n, and b unifies with a. And in this sense here, I know that this will select fewer methods than exist up there. I know that this part is boring, so I think I can uh, safely uh, omit the rest, but you get the idea. We do all those unification checks in this, inside the type system on patterns to determine what's more uh, general than what. So, yeah. You showed the meta construct you keep showing is four. Is that the only meta construct you have, or do you have choices? Right now, that's or? the only thing we have. Okay. And if we want to do ifs, we do them with uh, positive and negative nested patterns. So we can have a nested pattern. You will actually see an example in a couple of slides that doesn't have a primary pattern at all. It just says for all such that there does not exist uh, a get f produce this. Yeah. So, so it's even less than unification. It's substitution. Is it all cases when you check with this? There is unification actually both both, both. ways uh, to check uniqueness. So the next part, uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just say that very, very quickly, not go into an example. But the next big check is for uniqueness, of course. What I just discussed was validity. And validity is a one-way unification because we're trying to prove subset. So one uh, pattern has the abstract variables. The other pattern has the uh, concrete variables. But of course, uh, if we want to check uniqueness, what we have to do is do a two-way unification and uh, in fact, if I have something like this, I have two for loops and I want to ensure that they never produce conflicting members, I need to take the generated patterns and not actually the iteration patterns and make sure that they never unify. There are actually slightly more complex rules, but this is the essence here. I, I need to make sure that these never unify. In this particular case, these do unify because for some A2, which can be integer string, whatever, it's unbound. Uh, I can have A1 unify with list of A2, and I can have R2 unify with list of R1, and that would co produce a conflict. But we don't need to go uh, tediously in the example. Um, yeah. So in the end, is that kind of the error message that the user would get, or the error message is kind of get as convoluted as C++? Well, so that, that uh, I would like to say nice things about error messages, but the, the point is, we have a prototype compiler. The error message will be informative because there's no computation inside the for loops. So it will be a fairly informative error, error message that says there's something wrong here. But it's, it's, it's a potential conflict, right? There could be a best class which... Right. right. So it would be nice. Uh, so this is definitely something that we can provide. We can provide the uh, concrete uh, instance of the unification outcome that would trigger the error. But that's about it. I mean, so I think we can be fairly concrete in terms of errors. But right now, I, I do not have any standing to argue about the software engineering benefits of our compiler, which is half non-existent. You know, it, it type checks a few examples and does some things, but we, we haven't really play, uh, put in too much emphasis on that. And I'll skip all that. Uh, basically, the largest thing that we have tried is fairly similar to an application that uh, the previous related work tried, uh, the compile time reflection work that uh, Manuel Fendrick and Michael Carbin, who's coincidentally right over there, and Jim Laris did a couple of years ago. Uh, and we took uh, DSTM2, which, uh, which is a uh, software transactional memory package that uh, uh, Morris Herley, he had published about in uh, Uppsala 6, I think. And we re-engineered that using static reflection, using morphing techniques. Uh, and we use the same techniques as you saw before. So we add getters and setters. For each field, we add a whole bunch of code. We also depend on annotations. So for instance, we, we have matching of the following kind for all the fields of, F, uh, of X that match this pattern, any type, any name, and also are annotated with annotation atomic. I, we create an assignment shadow of f gets f. 
So we can also match on annotations. But the whole point is that this is a very nice application of taking something that would otherwise be done with runtime reflection or it would be done otherwise with low-level metaprogramming. Specifically, DSTM2 is built, is built with B-Cell, which is the bytecode engineering library, and replace this with a disciplined language feature. And you not only get economy of expression, but you also get safety, uh, modular safety when you're developing that code. So instead of about 1,100 non-comment in non-blank Java lines, we have about 374 lines in the MorphJ implementation of this. So to, to wrap up, uh, there's certainly quite a bit of related work uh, to what I just presented. There's type safe re reflection. Uh, there's the CTR work here at Microsoft Research. Uh, it uses patterns. It actually introduced the use of patterns for matching uh, for matching members and, uh, and for reasoning about uh, the validity of uh, generated code. In some ways, it's a richer language. It uses an explicit construct of transform as opposed to extending the generics. There's no detection of duplicates, so it only concentrates on validity, not on uniqueness of definition. Uh, it doesn't have integration with generics. It doesn't have quite a formal models, but, but it's certainly fairly related work. We had done some other work before on a system called SafeGen uh, that tries to prove similar properties but relies on a theorem prover, and it's a very unwieldy process. You, we don't want to do that. Why, why were you using a theorem prover? Why not? Why were you using a theorem prover? Because it was easy. We were just taking everything, translating it into first order logic, dumping it to an automatic theorem prover that's actually fairly good at reasoning automatically. It's uh, SPAS, which is fairly good for some fragments of first order logic. And if it, uh, uh, if it gave us a proof that one set is a subset of the other, then we were happy. We knew that we had our validity. So is that, uh, was that more complete than your current unification based story? Is that what, what's going on? It's a different language, but it's, uh, uh, it has more expressiveness. Okay. On the other hand, it's expressiveness modular termination of the theorem prover. So if it managed to prove it for the extended language, then that would be great. But, but uh, no one wants to use theorem provers as part of their daily software development process, uh, auto completely automatic theorem provers, because they're unpredictable animals. Uh, basically, if you're not willing to interface with a the theorem prover and guide them, guide it, yeah. There are ways to make theorem provers predictable. And I think Spass, actually, the theorem prover we, we picked is a decision procedure uh, for some prefix fragments of first order logic. And we always, we try to generate sentences that are within the bounded fragment, but we cannot do it for everything. Mm -hmm. So actually, it, it performed fairly well. But the point is, this is very much pie in the sky kind of researchy direction. I think that what I just presented today is not so researchy. It doesn't uh, expect uh, any progress in theorem proving technology or anything else. But I think that we did fairly well, actually, with a the theorem prover, with getting predictably but some you results. Do you expect that the extra expressiveness and safe chain is not really needed for practical programming? Everything that we've needed to do so far is captured by MorphJ. Okay. All right. But uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibilities that we'll need something more. I mean, here's one thing that you cannot do with MorphJ. You cannot say, for all methods of this class, uh, such that they have a return type, and the return type is such that it has a synchronized method. And the synchronized method takes an argument that itself has a volatile member. You cannot do this nesting of this kind and take uh, unknown quantities, unknown variables, and then based on those, discover more unknowns, discover more names on methods, etc. You cannot do that with our kind of nesting. That's the main expressiveness restriction of MorphJ. How many times do we want to do that? We haven't found real compelling examples in practice, but I can think of someone wanting to do that. Okay. And there were, uh, there were other systems, like there's the Danube system for type safe reflection, which, is, uh, which was around the same time as SafeGen, so it's an early attempt. It had the right idea, but it's not sound the way it does it. It doesn't really prove what it should. Of course, if we want to go to the entire, to my philosophy of what's structural abstraction, I have to include things there like the whole scrap your boilerplate line of work, which has static iteration over members of types, but it just computes a function over those instead of based on those members I will declare other members. Does not, does not declare other members. 
And of course, from an engineering standpoint, it's everything uh, we talked about before in terms of AOP. So there's AOP. I'll take aspect J as a representative because otherwise it becomes too unwieldy what I'm talking about. It lets, my, it lets us do a lot more things in terms of introspection of code, but there's no notion of modular type checking. There's no mo notion of modular reasoning with aspects generally. And at the same time, there's a difference in the philosophy. So if you apply an aspect, it changes the original code. With morphing, we don't change the original code. We produce a new type, and you can use the new type wherever you want. So that's a big difference there. So to conclude, I advocated a new abstraction mechanism called morphing, which is more general than some abstraction mechanisms, arguably, not more general than others. But definitely, for those that it's not more general than, it's, it's safer than. So it scores fairly high on the axis of it lets you do a lot of things, and it lets you do the lots of things safely. And it has a reference implementation in the MorphJ language. And I kind of see it as a representative of structural abstraction, which I'm hoping will be the next big wave in programming language evolution. Uh, and we have a, some publications that describe everything you saw today at ECOOP last year, PLDI this year, uh, and a couple of workshop papers uh, from last year. One pattern that uh, I feel like I've seen with these code generators or, or in general, you know, these, these metaprogramming systems is that you want the user to write, uh, let's, let's just take like an entity or something like a database, uh, OR mapper, for example, where you want the users to write down, here are the, here are the properties that are fields that I want the class to have, but then they also want to write down code that operates in terms of what's going to come out of the transformation that you want to run. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So you're both like doing the declaration and you're also writing code in terms of what you, what you want after the transformation. How mm -hmm. do you solve that, that situation? With, with well, I don't see that problem with uh, MorphJ because it does exactly the same thing as Java generics. So you could refer to that code. Uh, you could refer to that code from other code. Or do you mean you want to make assumptions on what the names are going to be of the methods? Well, I suppose you have to, like, if you declare some class X and you declare some fields in it, and then you want to talk about the transformed X, I guess you have to talk about the blah, blah, blah of X. Mm -hmm. And you sort of get into this naming issue again, I, I suppose. But, but So it's true that right now there's no way to say, fix me the set of output names based on this input type, and I will, not, I, I will want now those to be fixed for all eternity. Like, for instance, I want to create a synchronized list. I'm just taking all the names that exist right now in the list interface, in this version of the list interface, and I want to program against those. I don't want you to have to make me write a loop and say for all the members. I know that the list interface has those 15 members. There's no way for us to do that now. You have to write a loop. You have to write a static for and say, for all the members, do that. So I think I see your point in that sense, but I'll need to see a good motivating example there to see what we are missing. All right. okay. But otherwise, you can definitely refer to, uh, to morphed code arbitrarily, the same way that you would refer to Java generics code. Let me, let me put it differently. Now, do you find that there are cases where the input parameter to your morphs sometimes does not constitute a correct class. Because what makes it correct okay. is the morphing itself, right? No. And, and, and then I could imagine that there would be patterns where, you know, it's not correct until it's been morphed. And, and all of the missing methods that I know are going to be there, but, they haven't, but, but the morph is going to add them. And I don't want to have to, like, go write the prototype for them just so they can be there so that I can refer to them. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I see. sort of like this, this, this as, as the problem gets more entangled, I'm not sure that this, this mix-in approach is, is maybe more intricate than that. Right. Know? So right now we don't support that. Right now we assume that the input class is always well-formed. Yeah. But... I think that should be a, s a relatively simple matter to take a non-well-formed input class, remove some requirements. So if it says I implement this interface and it doesn't really implement this interface because it doesn't have all the members, well, remove the implements clause. Now it's not contradictory. And then you introduce a morphed class that says I take from this incomplete class and now I fill in all the rest so that it now supports the interface. 
So I'm thinking in the examples that I have in mind at least, I think we can take an impartial class, remove some requirements so that it's legal, there are no conflict with its members, and create the class that supports the extended set of requirements that I wanted to support up front. Does that make sense? Did I? Yeah, you have sort of a, a kernel and then yes. you know, the, the finish, the sort of the grown plant over here. Yeah. Exactly. And so the, the other thing that, that I worry a little bit about is how you're sort of like ultimately, after you're done with all these transformations, you would like there no, not to be any evidence that transformations have occurred, right? And I, I feel like this system ends up being very rich in evidence of, of previous transformations, like, you know, this notion of um, foos of bars of x's and, and implements interfaces and virtual methods that got all written and, and do you know what I mean? And at the end yes. of the day you you have this thing that doesn't quite look like a, a nice tight little package. You know? So basically you're arguing about this point. You would like something that's transparent. It transparently transforms your code instead of leaving more transparent. More transparent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and in fact what we are trying for in this language design is to go exactly the opposite way do the same thing as Java generics. Just explicitly say that I'm wrapping this in that and it produces a separate type and now it has a name and I can refer to it. So I agree with you. There, there will be the problem that in some cases what people want is just transparent transformation. And I don't know if that's an overwhelming usage scenario. I think the same typing ideas will apply if we were to apply them to transformation instead of generation of extra types, but we have not done that yet. Mike? So the first two types of abstractions that we um, showed at the beginning are abstractions that programmers use in every single time. The things that we need every time we make And it seems like the examples you gave of morph J seem to be the things that library writer is going to need to construct a library, but you know, they're only making the library once. I mean, once they have the synchronized classes in the, you know, on the Java library, you know, they're not going to necessarily do that again. And the same thing for that uh, parallel well, work. I actually disagree with that. Think of uh, the very first thing that you would like to do. Uh, things like aspect-oriented programming before and after methods. It's so common that you will say, I'd like for this type, before every one of its methods gets executed, I want this to happen. It's fairly trivial to do that by creating another type that annotates the methods the right way with MorphJ. That's an everyday task. I'm actually arguing that programmers do want that. They want it for testing a lot. I want to test those methods. I want to, I want to log these things. So I don't think actually it's so extreme as you put it. Now, arguably, Everything is a diminishing return games in every design activity. So yes, it's not going to be, it's not going to get you the same benefit as it got us to go from flat assembly language to procedural abstraction. But I do think that it's, it's a very significant benefit. Yeah, Matt. It strikes me that um, if, you, if you think about generative programming in a more general sense, it's, it's sort of, the, the, you're sort of taking the functional approach to it where you have a specification of a generation that takes some arguments and produces a result from that. And the arguments here happen to be always types, which is why you can use generics to represent uh, the, uh, the name of the result, so to speak. Now, have you, have you found that, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking there are other kinds of, ge of generic or uh, uh, generative programming where you want other kinds of arguments. A simple one is, I want to have, be able to get the tuple of size 8, and you give it the argument 8, and it produces a code that has 8 uh, axes and so on, right? Have you found that in some of your exa examples that you needed that kind of parameterization that's not over types? And, and have you thought about how, wh whether this extends to the other kinds of what you could call structural uh, abstraction? I, I wouldn't quite call it structural abstraction, but definitely I agree with you. So. Uh, there are other kinds of reasoning that we can do that are not on types and we don't generate new identifiers, but are, for instance, on integers, on things that have their own structure, which is exactly what you, uh, what you talked about. So in that sense, I think that uh, as related work, I should definitely mention staging and multi-stage languages. And staging, at least the, the statically typed multi-stage languages, do try, do get modular type safety. So that's kind of a well-understood problem. But if What's, what's its applicability? Its applicability is only to specialize code for higher performance. 
I mean, sometimes its applicability is also to, to make it more convenient. You want to generalize this for any dimensions. But, but the main idea, especially in what people have been able to statically type check, is only to specialize code for higher performance. And I don't think that the game right now is so much performance as it is this tediousness of having to deal with those interfaces repeatedly. And I want to remove that that kind of complexity. Uh, but I agree, that's, that's an interesting other dimension. It's just a complementary dimension of metaprogramming. And there, there is definitely work on trying to make that statically type safe, but we're not doing that in MorphJ. So morphing is not about that kind of metaprogramming. I'm not sure it's sorry, I've talked enough. Suppose you want to say, go through all my classes mm -hmm. and add this method to, to all of them. Yes. but. Um, we actually thought about applying this at the level of uh, higher than classes, like at the package. In the .NET world, it would make much more sense to do it at the assembly level than at the class level. In Java, pretty much the class level is a good compromise. Uh, I think that the, the same ideas will transfer over, but have we done it? No. But I think it's, it's exactly the same ideas that, well, that will just transfer over there. Yeah. So, so one more question that's totally different. Um, so in, in the Java world, people sort of learn to live with the pain of their generic types getting translated away by the compiler and not having, having only partial type information available at runtime. Mm -hmm. If you were on a, in a system like .NET where you, where you had full runtime type information, have you thought about how this would manifest itself? We have an expansion-based translation. So we do create multiple types for every expansion of a generic type. So we're not backwards compatible at the low level with Java types. So definitely it would be much easier for us, much more compatible for us to be in the .NET world. Yeah. Um, I think you might have answered this question already, but it went by too fast for me to comprehend. So if you have, if you have say, a, a list of int and a log list of int, there's an is a relationship between log list of int and list of int. Yeah. And there's an is a relationship between synchronized logged list event and logged list event. Whether there is or, or not, there, there could whether be. Whether you declare them to extend that or, or not, right? or whether you use to make things pattern when you declare the right. transfer was Right. Or if we do something like covariance, and then the checker will check that the methods are declared correctly. Yeah. So right now we don't have uh, covariance annotations. We don't support anything that so will they, say. So a synchronized log list of int is not necessarily a synchronized list of int. Not implicitly. Got it. You have to set it up so it is. Yeah. 